Well, hello and welcome to the One Life Young Adults Book Club. We're really, really excited. We've got this special interview today. So you'll all know that we've been reading Beautiful Resistance by John Tyson. And we indeed have John Tyson here with us today. Welcome, John. Um, it's good day, so everybody. Good to have you. Oh, so good to have you. And would you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you? What do you do? Where are you from? Okay, I'm originally from Adelaide, Australia. So uh, one of the most beautiful and unknown parts of Australia. Um, I moved to the US uh, over 20 years ago to study theology and uh, to, you know, uh, my official language would be like to strengthen and stir renewal in the Western church. Um, you know, it's big language, very humble efforts. Uh, I moved to New York City 16 years ago. That's where I am right now I'm in the middle of Manhattan. And uh, I pastor a church called Church of the City. And uh, we are a, a congregation predominantly filled with people in their 20s, sort of city centre. Um, probably the closest church I know of in the UK, similar to what we are, would be KXC with Pete Hughes in London. So he's a friend of mine. Mm. When I preach there, it feels like preaching at my church. So that'll give you mm. a bit of a sense of where we are in New York. Mm. Brilliant. That's amazing. We love KXC. One of our trustees yeah. is at KXC. And she's the person that got okay. me into one life, in fact. So big, big okay, fan gotcha. um, of them. Nice. That, that's brilliant. And round of question, what's your favourite thing about living in New York? Oh, the people, there's so much diversity. I've been married for 22 years. I have two kids. I have a son who's 20. I have a daughter who's 18. They've, uh, the vast majority of their lives have uh, grown up in New York. It's the diversity. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the ethnicities. It's the socioeconomic difference. It's the culture. It's the people. That's what makes New York mm -hmm. so great. That's the thing I love the most. Mm, love that great answer um Kenzie do you want to kick us off with some of the questions we've had yeah absolutely so um we put up a poll not a poll an Instagram um question okay. on our Instagram yep. um story just basically asking um if people had any questions and quite a okay. few people got back um with some really cool questions so um, number one, um, as young adults and people who are working with sort of young people what do you think the biggest issue or struggle um, that both young people and young adults are facing in the church? I think it's the issue of identity. People don't really know who they are. If they know who, if they really knew at a soul level who they are, how God views them, the place they hold in his kingdom, their eternal destiny, I, I think cementing identity is almost everything. Jesus, when he was tempted, um, was tempted around the issue of identity. So Matthew 3, the father says, this is my beloved son, baptized, is baptized. The spirit falls on him. Satan comes along, giving it his best shot after all he's learned about destroying humanity. And he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, he basically questions the very thing the father just said about him. And I think if we cement that, really work on that, get that into our deep spirits, we will be prepared to live out of our identity and that gives us the framework to face all the other multitude of challenges mm. in the church and world today. That's amazing. Mm. Awesome. Thank That's, you. Yeah, brilliant. Mm. Love that answer. Like for you, what does that look like on like a daily basis of going okay. in and getting your identity? Massive. Created? Yes. Declarations. These sound mm. kind of crazy, but it's just like getting a list of like, this is who I am in Jesus. In Jesus, I'm loved. I'm chosen. I'm free all those sorts of things and um yeah so and then just declaring those things again and again and again and again and again mm -hmm. taking it into my heart taking it into my spirit we live in a culture filled with lies we are being lied to all the time we have literally like we're on a drip in a hospital and what's being fed into us is lies and so we have to spend as much time as that getting the antidote uh of truth about who we are so Meditating on the promises of God, declaring those over myself, speaking them out, worshipping in response to it. Those very mm. simple things, but mm. often neglected. Mm. I love that. That's really, really practical and helpful and really doable um, mm. as well. Thank you. Um, and then the, the, this bit was written before COVID hit. Am I right in thinking that? Um, yes. And these last 12 months have just been completely not what anyone expected or saw coming and one of the questions was just around if you've known um that covid was coming that church was going to look completely different for the next 12 months is there anything you would have changed in what you're writing or maybe something you would have um yeah drawn more on or emphasized more in the book or yeah what would you have changed well, so 
Yes, I would have added. I, I don't think I would have changed anything in the book. Um, I would have added two chapters. I would have added a chapter on prayer. But I, the reason I didn't put that in there is because I had planned to write a book on prayer and I didn't want to take the seeds from that chapter, which would become a full book. I wish I just put that stuff in there. So I wish there was a chapter on like prayer must be stronger than despair or, you know, prayer mm. must resist despair or something. The other thing I would have put in there, I would have talked about resilience, the importance of resilience. Mm. And, um, you know, we're at the point we're, we're facing stuff we've never faced before. And it really is a story of how do you persevere? How do you persevere? How do you live out of overflow in a time of drought? And uh, Psalm 1, Jeremiah said, basically, there's a way of rooting ourselves in God where regardless of what's happening in the external world, we will be planted with an internal access to the river and life of God. Mm -hmm. And I would have talked about how to position your life near the stream of God through secret prayer and abiding. So I would have done a whole thing on resilience in there as well. Mm. I love that. Let us know when it comes out and yeah. we can put <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there first in line. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And I, I, yeah, I think Helen can agree with this. Like there's just so much gold in this book um, and there's so many takeaways, but what one thing would you recommend for, for someone not really knowing where to start to take away from it? Oh, you know, I mean, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So that comes from the book of Nehemiah where the children of Israel are in the middle of rebuilding a city and they're just discouraged. They've just realized, they've just had the word of the Lord read to them. They just realized how backslidden they are. They've realized how much work there is to go. And when, the, when they hear the truth, they just sort of weep out of despair. And Nehemiah, by the way, he's not a pastor or a priest, he's a secular leader. Nehemiah stands up and says, this is not a day for mourning. This is a day for joy. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. So he says, don't weep. And then it says they, they went to eat fatty meats and drink sweet drinks and make great rejoicing. Mm -hmm. And I think so maybe the chapter on um, celebration must resist cynicism could be the most important thing because we have to remember the beauty in the midst of all the brokenness where our hearts will collapse. We have mm -hmm. to remember those small things that are filled with life and wonder. Victor Frankl, when he was in, uh, in the Holocaust dealing with those concentration camps, like a lot of what he got out of was like the ability to pay attention to tiny amounts of beauty. And they strengthened his heart, gave him the ability to endure. So, yeah, learning to celebrate the discipline of celebration is where I get people to start. Mm. Love that. Love that. The importance of celebration is so good. Um, and actually talking of Nehemiah, we've been – Last year, we've been reading as a team, Nehemiah. Um, okay. It feels like we've been reading for a really long time, but that's just really interesting. We haven't even got to that bit yet. Um, so that's really cool. Wow. Just, a year like, and you're, you're not even there. Yeah. That's proper Bible study. <laughs> We're taking it seriously. <laughs> very, very seriously. Um, but that's brilliant. Um, one other question, which is related to kind of two chapters, um, it says, how can we still fight injustice and speak up against inequality while showing both hospitality over fear and honour over contempt? Well, I, I think those are, so to me, the, yeah, the vision of fighting injustice, that's the vision. What mm -hmm. are the tactics or tools of doing that? Well, honouring people that people have turned into an other. And so you, when, it, when you don't see somebody as your equal, First of all, you dismiss them, but secondly, you turn them into a commodity. You think, how can mm -hmm. I use these people? They're not worthy of equal relationship. Therefore, I view them as a utility. And when you honour people and see their humility, it's, it stops that progress. What, what if in, in the American South and the same in uh, you know, the UK, back when slavery was a thing, what if people didn't say, how can I utilise you as a commodity mm -hmm. to get basically leverage you for financial prosperity? What if people said, how can I ever do this to somebody? They are a human being. That's what honour does. It recognises the value people carry. And we live in a society that only views the economic value people have rather than the intrinsic value. So I think it was Wilberforce, you know, printing those coins that they were published, am I not your brother, which is an appeal to seeing the Imago Dane people. So that's what honour does. It, it sees the full humanity of people. And then hospitality deconstructs our fear of the other, which often causes us to have ungodly boundaries in the first place. So when, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, what one sociologist uh, called human, uh, humanizing an issue, which means you take this 
humanizing the representative representative group. So we have these stereotypes in our minds about who people are and what they're like and they're them and they're over there and they're all the same. Then you meet someone, you share a meal with them or have coffee with them, you're like, oh, my gosh, they're a person too. And so mm. I try to address the, the beauty of creating those free and fearless spaces where enemies can be converted into the friends because we learn each other's stories. We realize what we have in common. So to me, yeah, the vision, justice, the tools, honor, and hospitality, if we did way more of that, many of the cycles, the perpetuated injustice would be raged against and some of them would be broken. Mm. I love that. That's so helpful, actually, seeing the difference between the vision and the tools and actually how do we do this? And it's not the things you would naturally think to pick up, but it's effective and it's the way of Jesus. I love that. Mm. That's so good. Um, Yeah, so like just going on the back of that, why do you think the church find it so hard to, um, yeah, I guess the word resist. Um, Why do you think it's so hard for the church to to have that standpoint and talk about this stuff? Because it is so important. I mean, the culture is so powerful. I mean, like, you know, I, I wish we'd learn this all over again, but we're just rooted in the wrong places. Mm-hmm. The children of Israel, I mean, they, they've been delivered with the most dramatic, miraculous things you can think of, like the plagues and then past of the Red Sea and then Moses pops up to get the Ten Commandments. And they're like, whatever happened to this bloke? Who cares? Hey, make us some gods. And so, like, they are literally six weeks out of deliverance and then make another god. And then God says to them, when you go into the nations, you know, when you inherit the promised land, be very, very careful not to take on the practices of the pagans around you. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then Paul says in the New Testament, hey, all that stuff with idolatry, that was written to warn you. And then I'm like 2,000 years later, we got the Old Testament, we got the New Testament, we got all of church history. Mm-hmm. Why don't we learn this? Here's what we fail to take into account how formative the culture is. It's attacking our thinking. It's attacking our habits, our practices, our desires. Society, as James K. Smith says, is just a giant recruitment mechanism of our affections. Mm. And so we Mm. learn to love the wrong things and then we want the wrong things and then we pursue the wrong things. And so to me that we we have to be rooted in the love of God. This was Paul's great prayer in Ephesians 3, rooted and grounded. And then he has something fascinating. He says that our hearts are so weak that we actually have to pray for strength to have stronger hearts, to contain more of God's love. Mm. You were made, we were made to give love to God and to receive love from God. Mm. And so the, the goal of life then is to create environments and relationships that facilitate the giving and receiving of the love of God. And that's often not at the center of the church. It's, it's like serving, volunteering, programming, and so we're busy and burned out. Therefore, we're susceptible to medicating our exhaustion with the things of the world rooted and grounded in love that's why abiding and abiding prayer is the central practice of our faith mm-hmm. love that just yeah starting at the root starting at the beginning that's so good so practical mm. yeah it's really good and i loved the whole chapter around um idolatry i think for me that was like the most challenging like i remember i was listening to an audiobook and just going for a walk with it and just being like oh okay and um, just that real challenge of how easy it is to put the to have idols um in place without thinking about it and i think knowing like chatting to the team about it we've all really felt that and just felt really really struck by that even as christians people who are saying no i'm really serious about my faith that we can so easily and it's so easy to look at you know the israelites and say well why why did they do that like we're so stupid like why are they worshiping golden calf but actually we do exactly the same thing um it's just a yeah a shaking a reality check so yeah love that um our final question is okay. maybe it's quite a, a harsh question for you but which of these resistances do you think is the most countercultural at the moment i know you won't want to choose one but if you had to which would you choose enemy love mm. enemy love jesus says if you love those who love you what good is that you are even tax collectors and sinners mm. do that. But Jesus says something so crazy. He says, your father is merciful and kind mm-hmm. to the wicked and the ungodly. Oh, your father is merciful and he's kind to the wicked. God is kind to the wicked. Mm-hmm. I was meditating on that last night and I was just like, God, increase my heart. Mm-hmm. Give me a bigger heart. I don't have enough agape love in me. You know, it's people in the, in the world these days that drive me crazy. 
And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's too much flesh in my responses. So to me, enemy love is the distinctive. The, the, the Christians conquered mm -hmm. Rome through enemy love. They just mm -hmm. literally were like, who are you? And it's Jesus. What sort of love is Jesus on the cross being crucified? He's like, Father, forgive me. What is that? Mm -hmm. Do I have the capacity as the culture is crucifying me to say, Father, forgive them, I love them. So mm -hmm. that to me is the most controversial. We, we love to hate our enemies, villainizing people, demonizing people, but honoring people, loving people, gosh, that's the stuff of Christianity. That's mm -hmm. the voice of Jesus from the cross through our lives into the world today. That's the one for mm -hmm. me. Mm, wow that's brilliant it, yeah so challenging so so challenging um and just as we finish this up i was just wondering would you pray for us um yes. just the group that we're watching this it's young adults um across the uk who are just wanting to engage and go deeper and follow jesus in every space that they're in and um, so we would just love if you would pray over us okay sure let's pray Father, we just come into your presence now and we just pause just to position ourselves before you uh, in humility and in wonder. Lord, thank you for your great love that you've lavished on us and that you've called us children of God and that's what we are. Father, I just pray for a fresh realisation of that love, fresh baptism of the liquid love of God into the hearts of people who are listening to this. Father, I do pray strengthen their hearts with a larger capacity to carry and experience your love. So Holy Spirit, right now, I just pray that whoever's listening, Lord, if they're jogging or driving or sitting in their room, Holy Spirit, I just pray, come through these devices and fill their hearts with love. Mm -hmm. And Father, I just pray as a result of that, that they would, they would just respond in radical discipleship out of love and loyalty to Jesus to live like you and to live for you wherever they are. I pray fresh vision, fresh dreams, fresh hunger for you, a fresh desire to serve, a fresh capacity and energy when people are so tired for everything we've been through. And so, Lord, we just confess we need you, we rely on you, and so we call on you and we receive from you because you're good and you're kind. So come, Holy Spirit, strengthen those who are listening and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. thank you sweet no worries cool. all right and thank you guys for watching and we'll be back uh, with another book but um yeah thank you so much john for your time and for praying for us just brilliant no worries mm -hmm. grace and peace